Good morning and welcome to the 13th meeting of the COVID-19 Recovery Committee in 2021. This morning we'll take evidence at the stage one of the Coronavirus Discretionary Compensation for Self-Isolation Scotland Bill. I'd like to welcome to the meeting Sandra McLeod, Chief Officer of Aberdeen City Health and Social Care Partnership, Michael Clancy, Director of Law Reform, Law Society of Scotland, Mike Brewer, Deputy Chief Executive of the Resolution Foundation, Susan McKellar, Operations Manager from Scottish Women's Convention. Thank you for giving us your time this morning. The session will be the first of the committee's evidence sessions on the bill. Before we hear from the Deputy First Minister on the 16th of December, each member will have approximately 12 minutes to speak to the panel and ask their questions. We, we should be okay for time this morning. However, I apologise in advance. If time runs on too much, I may have to interrupt members or witnesses in the interests of brevity. I'll now turn to questions, and if I may begin by asking the first question. If I could ask the panel, in relation to the rationale for the bill and whether the bill as proposed is the most appropriate route for achieving its objectives, can I start with Sandra McLeod, please? Good morning. Um, I feel that the, the bill in achieving its support for both um, people on low incomes to, to help them to remain in self-isolation is a positive move. In addition, I think that the impact from an NHS perspective in not returning to the previous state is also a positive move, given the Thank you very much. impact that that would have. A, the, um, Sorry, I think you just cut, cut out there. Did you have anything else to add? No. Okay. Thank you, Sandra. Can we move on to Michael Clancy? Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much indeed, Convener. Um, well, I, I'm not going to comment on the, the uh, appropriateness of the policy. Uh, I, th I think I can leave that to others to comment upon. Uh, but what I can say about whether or not using this bill is the most appropriate measure, uh, well, of course, uh, there would be alternatives. Um, uh, the uh, as the, uh, the policy memorandum makes clear, these alternatives were considered uh, to allow uh, mandatory, the mandatory compensation provisions to resume uh, when uh, Schedule 21 expires, uh, to issue regulations uh, under Sections 56 and 58 of the Public Health Scotland uh, Act um, uh, in 2008, um, uh, but there were doubts about whether those regulations would be flexible enough or broad enough, um, uh, and of course, uh, it would be also possible um, uh, for the government to use powers under the Coronavirus Scotland Act 2020, Section 90, to extend the modification uh, of the Public Health uh, etc. Scotland Act. But that extension would only have been up to uh, the 25th of September 22 uh, initially, and would have been subject to. Uh, six month extensions thereafter. So I can see perfectly clearly why the Scottish Government alighted on the current solution, which is to produce uh, the, the bill before the committee today. Uh, and uh, it seems to me, um, uh, and I hope I'm not talk talking out of turn, not having consulted any uh, of my colleagues on this, uh, but it seems to me that that's the most appropriate way to go. It's clearer, uh, it uh, allows the Government uh, to achieve its policy objective, uh, and also it, it ensures that uh, we get the opportunity to give evidence to the committee today. Thank you very much, Mr Clancy. Mike Brewer, would you like to come in? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, well, this bill is, is an odd one, isn't it? Because it's basically there to stop the Scottish Government from paying out large amounts of money to everybody who has to self-isolate uh, with an estimated cost of £300 million pounds a year, um, but it obviously focuses attention on the support that exists, that does exist for those people who do need to self-isolate through the, um, the self-isolation grant. And obviously it is vital that that grant does continue while the coronavirus crisis continues and there is a, a pressing need for people to be able. Thank you very much. And Susan McKellar, thank you. Thank you, convener. Yeah, we would 
we would support uh, the bill that has been put before the committee. Anything that is going to help families in low income uh, maintain some level of income coming in when they are having to self isolate is of benefit. And we would say that obviously, with the uncertainty around coronavirus at the moment, with the new strains coming out, it is more important than ever that we keep that flexibility to be able to put that grant forward for those in the lowest income. Thank you very much. Murdoch, can we move to your questions, please? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Convener. Good morning to the, the panel. I've got two, two different uh, areas I'd like to um, ask about. Um, the first question is to Michael Clancy. Uh, good morning, uh, Michael. Um, and I, I just picking up a point that you make in your uh, submission on behalf of the Law Society, uh, which is a, a process point about the power for Scottish Government to um, make regulations and the requirement that they should publish a statement of reasons along with that. And you do make the comment uh, that uh, you believe it should be made clear uh, that the statement of reasons should also explain why it's necessary to make the regulations urgently before they're approved by Parliament. Can you just expand on that, please, Michael, and explain what the background to your thinking is on that particular point? Surely, um, let me just get the, the section in front of me. Uh, so, um, the powers uh, for making regulations under Section 4 of the Bill uh, include uh, that uh, if the Scottish Ministers consider that regulations need to be made urgently, uh, 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 then uh, subsections 2 and 3 of Section 4 do apply, uh, and the regulations, which are then termed emergency regulations, must be laid before the Scottish Parliament uh, and cease to have the effect of the expiry of 28 days, uh, beginning with the date on which they are made. Uh, so, if the emergency regulations are made, uh, the Scottish Ministers must at the same time uh, lay before uh, Parliament a statement of reasons for making the regulations. Uh, but um, look, I think the point is that there is no definition of uh, emergency, um, uh, and uh, the uh, it is only if the Scottish Ministers consider that the regulations need to be made urgently in terms of Section 4.4, uh, and uh, why do Scottish Ministers uh, uh, think that, it needs, uh, that the regulations need to be made urgently is the question uh, that we are seeking the answer to here. And that is why we suggested that the statement of reasons could also uh, explain why uh, the uh, Ministers require this urgency uh, in uh, making the regulations uh, before they were approved by Parliament. Um, it, there could be many reasons for this. There could be um, a, a, a significant spike uh, in uh, coronavirus across the country. Uh, there could be uh, some uh, issues in relation to finance. Um, uh, there could be lots of reasons. Uh, it is not really for me to speculate on what Scottish Minister's reasons may be uh, uh, in the future, uh, but what we think is appropriate it is that Scottish ministers are transparent about the reasons for urgency, um, uh, and that, that that is made clear to Parliament, um, uh, so that uh, in, in contemplation uh, of the regulations after they've been made, remember this is after they've been made, um, uh, Parliament can then uh, assess whether it was appropriate for Scottish ministers to take the route in section 4.4. I hope that answers your question, Mr Fraser. Th thank you. Yes, that's very helpful. And that's an issue we can we can take up with the Scottish Government when we when we see them. Um, I've got a, a different issue I'd like to raise, and maybe I can address this question to um, Susan McKellar, first of all, from the Scottish Women's Convention. And I, I was concerned to read in your uh, consultation uh, response that having um, consulted with women, uh, none of them had been successful in accessing the self-isolation support grant or local self-isolation uh, assist assistance service, despite all of them having to self-isolate. Now, I don't know how many women you actually you know, spoke to in this respect. It might be helpful if you could clarify that. But clearly that is a point of concern because you know, the, whole, the whole purpose of putting in place this uh, grant scheme for self-isolation was to support those 
who are in that situation and need additional financial assistance. So um, can, can you give us a bit more background on that and explain why it is that you know, people were not able to access the grants? Did they find it just too difficult to apply or did they apply and were they turned down or were there other reasons? Thank you, Myrtle. Yeah, uh, we did a survey online uh, because we wanted to put a consultation in with regards to the self-isolation self grant. We put a survey out online and we did that through our network, so that reached over 4,000 women on our network. I think there was over 100 that actually applied to the survey. We also went out to our networks and asked women uh, who we knew had self-isolated if they had received the grant. And basically what they were saying to us was some of them didn't even know it existed for them to be able to claim. Uh, some of them said that they they didn't know how to how it would affect current benefits that they were on. So some people were on universal credit and they thought that if they claimed for this grant, that would get taken off uh, in the future from their universal credit. There wasn't much information coming out from the advisors who were actually giving out the information. One lady had phoned to, to find out if she was entitled and they asked her if she was on benefits. She said no, but she was on one of, a low income bracket, but she never ever claimed benefits because she always worked. So because she didn't claim the benefits, they said she wasn't entitled when she probably would have been because she was on that. I don't even think she was on the real minimum wage, but it was something then that put her off from applying for it. So we've got instances like that. We also have instances where uh, they thought that it would be too much hassle to go through that to try and get some money. And by the time they got the money, uh, they would be back at work anyway, so they didn't bother. Uh, so there was that kind of uh, behind that as well. And it depended on really the, the health boards and stuff like that that were, that were putting this out there as well. We got one woman who said she got a SMS text message saying to her that if she wanted to apply for the grant, she could do that by returning a message to the SMS and she did that and received nothing back seven weeks later. So that there is a lot of different things going on there that is contributing to the fact that these women aren't able to access these funds. Uh, and I think some of them thought that they didn't want to claim benefits as well because of the stigma and discrimination that's attached with claiming benefits. So that was just some of the findings that we found with the women we spoke to. Thank, thanks. That's, that's, that's really helpful. Um, just, just to follow that up, I mean, did, did you get any response from, from the, the, the women you consulted with as to whether they thought there was enough publicity around this scheme? Were, were, you know, were they actually aware of it? Um, and if so, how did they hear about it? Yeah, but what we heard from women, what we heard from them was that there wasn't enough publicity about it. It should be in health centres and places where they're able to access during times uh, they should have been advised at point of contact. Uh, and I think it has been getting better, but uh, near the beginning of the pandemic, when the, the bill was brought out and the, the grant was brought out, there wasn't much information coming out about it. I think since furlough has been stopped, as you can see in your statistics, there's been more uptake in it because there hasn't been any other money coming behind that. So people are having to look for other things. So I think that's when the uptake has started coming in because furloughed kind of stopped and, and people didn't have anything else to, to help their, their their income at that point when they were having to self-isolate. But they said that obviously with the closures of the libraries and, and, and things like that happening, it's making it more difficult for them to access. And especially if you've got uh, like technology poverty, where you, you can't actually get access online in your own home to get these things. So it has to be more accessible for women. So in places that, that they're able to go during this period of time, uh, they just felt there wasn't enough support there to access those services as well and, and to talk them through it. Th thanks. Thanks very much. I, I don't know if um, either Sandra McLeod or Mike Brewer want to add anything to that on this point. Sandra, you're nodding your head. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think um, there's some really valid points being made there and just really like to um, share some of the local practice that's been happening within Aberdeen, just really to pick that up. I think the poverty agenda is quite significant um, around about health, so it is important that we um, ensure that people can access all of this. So I think from a local area that we did have, we've received around 3,234 applications for this grant. 
um, and around a 53% reward rate only. However, that is around um, initially there was quite restrictive on how things were going, but changes have definitely helped that move forward. There's also been things created such as a dedicated web page and created an online application forum. Schemes promoted when staff are phoning people to say that they're going into isolation and also offering if um, you know there's a requirement for help to fill in the online application and someone will phone back, as well as our crisis support line for people who may also um, help the online challenges there. So I think it's just to say that I'm um, absolutely acknowledging what Susan's saying, but just to say that there is evidence and people are picking that up to really try to promote this as an opportunity for people to help in that poverty agenda. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I move to John Mason? Sorry, I forgot. Uh, thanks so much, uh, convener. Um, yeah, I think it was um, was it Mr. Brewer that said, uh, you know, we're, this is an unusual bill and that we're actually saving money rather than spending it. Um, I mean, can anyone clarify if we had left or if we did leave the 2008 Act in place, what would, I mean, I know the figure is 380 million or something would be the cost, but what would an individual be entitled to instead of 500 pounds? I don't know if that's something, Mr. Brewer, is that something you're aware of or? Um, I, I think the answer, the answer is it, that is not known. And in the paper that was put to, and in the, Sorry, and in the estimates that were made by the Scottish Government, um, or by the Scottish Pots, or, or by Spice, sorry, I've forgotten which one, one it was, they recognise that um, the cost, you know, this, this event, this £300 million, pounds, so it might be very high, because it might be that the Government would not oblige to um, compensate high earners for the full loss of their earning. And so that is, that, that is one reason why they thought that the, co you know, the cost of not passing this bill will be very high. If you have to fully compensate every everybody, uh, regardless of their earnings, fully for their earnings, then that is going to be a very large cost to the Scottish Government. I, I mean, is that actually what happens if somebody gets Ebola or something like that? I mean, is the 2008 Act ever actually used? I'm afraid I don't know that, sorry. OK, I don't know if any of the other witnesses can help me on that. Doesn't look like it. No. Okay. Yeah, I'll, ask, I'll ask the government that one when we get there, um, because I think Sage, just as a comment, had said that you know we need full pay and comprehensive support, but clearly that would be very, very expensive. Um, I, I suppose I know we're not looking at the level here, but I think some of the responses that came in did actually look at the five hundred pound level. So um, possibly a. I'm not quite sure who should be going to, but perhaps Susan McKellar. Um, I mean, is the £500 appropriate? Is it, has it been working? I mean, you're saying a lot of people haven't got it, but, you know, is, is your feeling that £500 is appropriate or should it be higher or should it be organised in some different kind of way? Well, for us, the £500 is something that I think is, is beneficial to anybody that's not getting any income. When we spoke to the women that we spoke to, uh, quite a lot of them were on low like minimum income wages. They were in jobs like hospitality, uh, hospitality sector. They, they, they were in jobs which were precarious with zero hour contracts and things like that. So for them, any money would have helped. But they did say that the ones that didn't claim uh, that the loss of money that they had was in real time benefit, as in there was more electricity costs, food costs, uh, the fact that even when they were trying to do their shopping, they were having to do that online at, at shops that delivered, which were more expensive than shops that, that didn't deliver, such as like supermarkets like Aldi and Lidl, who don't do it, but are a lot cheaper than going to see as the Morrison Sainsbury's, but they're the only ones that kind of do the delivery. So they did say that the cost one woman went into her savings and used quite a lot of her savings during that period because she didn't want to not that she didn't want to claim, she didn't think she was entitled to claim those benefits. Uh, so what we would say is five hundred pounds would be a fair estimate, but it should go in in, in line with real life poverty as a major factor. So ensuring that that's meeting the, the real wage criteria, it might be more than £500. So I think you would have to look at it uh, on each aspect of what that person was earning and what technically they're, they're missing out in real term, including your electricity, your food, things like that. And I mean, if I can stick with yourself, I mean, 
I think it, it, the figures are only one in eight workers are entitled to this payment anyway, and you've made the point that some people aren't getting it. But what about, say, a single woman with children, single mother, um, you know, who's a bit further up the scale, but ju you know, just managing her mortgage, just managing food and electricity and all the rest of it. Now, she's not going to get anything for self-isolating. Is, is there a problem there? Yeah. Yeah, we, we think there is a problem there because uh, these are the people that can get tipped into that poverty bucket, as we would say. 10 days is a long time, uh, and before that it was 14 days is a long time not to have any income. And if you're not entitled to that grant, your employer might only pay you statutory sick pay. So you're losing a big chunk of your money, and you probably don't have any savings there to dip into. So it actually is putting you back in... You're always trying then to get back on your feet to get to an even keel. With those costs going up as well, with regards to electricity, your, your fuel poverty is a major thing at the moment as well, as well as food poverty and insecurity. More people are trying to access food banks than ever before, and most of them are working. So they would be in that category. So I, I think it should be looked at on that basis whether it's the real time, how much is this going to cost, and would that put that person under that real living wage? And if it does, then they should be entitled to that grant. OK, thanks. And then finally, maybe I could ask... A, I'll, well, try Sandra McLeod, although maybe anybody else would want to come in. But, I mean, we, we saw figures that when people are asked if they do self-isolate when they're meant to, 94% say they do, uh, but in practice, in reality, only 74% are doing it. Um, so people's claims are somewhat out of line with what they're doing. So, I mean, what, what is your feeling about self-isolation? Is it actually working? Are people doing it? Our, our understanding is that um, it is one of the key contributors to help break the chain of the disease, you know, help break the chain of spread. So, um, from our understanding, it is something that is helpful. It is progressing, but there will always be, I suppose, people who choose not to, to follow the guidance um, and who choose not to. I think, as um, Susan's rightly highlighted, and as the Bill's trying to achieve, anything that we can do to encourage people and to help support that and help support the self-isolation is a positive step. Is there anything we could be doing apart from paying the money? Um, I'm not sure. I, th I think okay. it's... You know, we're encouraging people to do that. We can give the acknowledgement. We have our contact tracers. Everyone's there. There's a high level of support that's given... Um, volunteer assistance, you know, all of that that's in place, but um, sometimes it does, it will come down to personal choice and whether people are willing to um, expose others to the risk. Okay, thanks, Kavir. Thank you. Can I move to Alex Rowley, please? Uh, good morning. C can I pick up uh, perhaps on the point, Sandra? I was quite interested to hear what Aberdeen Health and Social Care Partnership is doing in terms of promotion around, around this grant. Um, so it would be good, perhaps, if you could send some of that information to us. But is there is there a general issue? Does any, any member of the panel think there's there's a general issue that we actually need to do more? Government, firstly, in terms of seeing what what it's doing, but also what's happening on the ground to promote the fact that that people can get some kind of support if they're struggling. Maybe start with with Susan. I think we can always do more to support uh, these kind of grants, these kind of initiatives. I, I think the problem is we're getting bombarded with so many different messages and they're changing quite a lot that people are not sure what the current guidelines are and what processes they should go through. So I think when we are thinking of how we're promoting isolation and staying in. The adverts are great, but they don't say that you're entitled to it. There's not really anything on those TV adverts, anything like that, to say that check this or this, this national phone number to check if you're eligible for a self-isolation grant. And I think more has to be done with regards to that. I mean, we, we've had over 700,000 people with COVID. Sorry, I think you've frozen there. Can we bring in Michael Clancy? There we are. Um, thank you, convener. So, there were two thoughts which crossed my mind in, in relation to this discussion, um, unless 
Sandra, who's back now in live motion. Maybe she wants to conclude her point. Sandra, would you like to come in? Yes, sir. Sorry, she's not back yet. We can't see her on our screens. Okay, very good. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, two thoughts which cross my mind. First is that uh, under Section 56 of the Public Health etc. Scotland Act, uh, there has to be a notification in writing um, uh, that the person uh, uh, is required to quarantine uh, or self-isolate, as we call it. Um, uh, and uh, so, therefore, it would possibly be uh, that that, uh, that notification in writing it should be the place where uh, information about uh, the grant is made available directly to the individuals who are uh, concerned uh, and, and would be eligible uh, to, to uh, get a discretionary payment under the, uh, the, the Act. Uh, so, therefore, I, I think that that might be a way in which um, uh, one could uh, invite the Scottish Government to explore um, uh, getting the information directly to those uh, who may be eligible to claim uh, the, the uh, self-isolation grant. The second is uh, going to Mr Mason's point about uh, 90 people say they will comply, but 70 per cent apparently only, uh, only 70 per cent do. Uh, if there is a dispute um, uh, which arises under Section 56 uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the Public Health Act uh, about a person's entitlement, in other words, have they self-isolated, uh, or the amount of such compensation, is, is the compensation uh, the, the right amount, uh, then uh, there is a, a dispute mechanism in the Act uh, which allows for an arbitration provision, um, uh, and it, if that does not result in an agreement, uh, then uh, that would then uh, go to the sheriff. Now, uh, applying these sorts of solutions to questions about entitlement uh, to the grant uh, may take another leap of faith and might need some some further tweaks to the legislation. Uh, but it, I, I think it gives us an idea of, of uh, solutions to the issue of um, uh, getting notification about the information. Uh, about the question of who is uh, isolating uh, and whether they are actually doing that, uh, and uh, how one can resolve a dispute which might arise about entitlement uh, to the grant rather than the compensation under the Act um, uh, uh, in, in, in the round. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Clancy. We've got Susan McCullough's back, and she'd like to come back in. <coughs> Hi, sorry about that. I just lost my signal. Yeah, what we were saying is that the more that could be done with regards to adverts and stuff like that to show people, especially ones on low income, that there is some support there would be helpful for them. There is instances uh, of just listening there uh, to Michael, and with regards to the grant, I think there has to be discretions in there. We had one woman who said that her contract for a new job was due to start the day after she was told to isolate, so she wasn't entitled to the grant or any statutory sick pay. So that left her in a precarious position for ten days. So we have to look at these kind of discretions in amongst this bill. We have moved it forward uh, with regards to the grant and some of the criteria that Sandra had said before. Uh, and I think we need to look at certain conditions. We need to look at it intersectionally to see actually what kind of things can happen and how can we make sure that as many people as possible can get this grant. Now, what I was trying to say is that we've had over 730,000 people positive with COVID and only 43,000 uh, 43, of them. So you're looking at that 6 per cent uptake. When we know that poverty is a lot higher than that, so we know that people aren't claiming, so we need to do more to make sure that they are aware that they are able to access that. What we would say is that people aren't getting reasons why they're being rejected sometimes. It's just that your claim is unsuccessful. So I think we need to be more transparent about why those claims are being rejected and uh, keeping uh, information and data about that so that we can follow that to see if there are certain groups that are missing out on that and for what reasons. Thank you, um, Susan. I, I thought that was those points are, are, are really important in terms of looking at the wider spread. Can I just quickly come and ask Michael just a quick question around the relevance of the 2008 Act? 
I mean, there's consensus that it certainly would not be suitable uh, in terms of the current COVID. But is the Act itself too widely drawn? Is it, is it, do we need to actually visit the Act at some point, Michael? I, I think it's fair to say, Mr. Rowley, that, that uh, we've recommended that the whole uh, vista of emergency legislation uh, in relation to um, uh, whatever emergencies there might be needs some revision, um, uh, because the options uh, which would be uh, at the hand of government uh, prior to the to the pandemic would have been uh, to to deal with things under the Public Health Scotland Act. Um, uh, or uh, under uh, the Civil Contingencies Act, um, uh, and uh, we haven't seen or heard uh, of the Civil Contingencies Act uh, since it was uh, uh, enacted uh, and applied, I think, in relation to some agricultural emergencies in uh, the, uh, the early 2000s. Uh, so there is a need, I think, to look at why we got into the position where in uh, 2020, uh, the Coronavirus Act of 2020, the UK Act, had to be enacted at such speed, with only four days parliamentary consideration in Westminster, um, uh, why it was necessary, necessary for the first Coronavirus Scotland Act uh, to be taken under emergency uh, procedure in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and we can understand why uh, the second Coronavirus Act uh, could be taken at a little bit more leisure. Uh, but, um, but nevertheless, the fact that we had to make all this law uh, indicates that our previous uh, law for dealing with emergencies might not have been up to, uh, up to uh, dealing with uh, the problem and fit for purpose. So now, uh, perhaps after the, the current emergency is, is fully over, and I can't begin to predict when that will be. Uh, but when uh, when things have settled down sufficiently, then I think we should all get our heads together and look closely at our emergency legislation uh, and uh, apply it, because clearly the coronavirus legislation only applies to coronavirus. Uh, if some other uh, uh, viral agent uh, or uh, some other form of emergency were to be visited upon us, what would we do then if we couldn't just apply that act to such a circumstance? It, it, we need to look at, at our, our law for emergencies, make sure that we put something which is fit for purpose and flexible enough to meet every contingency. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thank you. Can I bring in Sandra McLeod? I apologize. It's my um, response has been covered by the two previous um, witnesses. Okay, thank you. Jim Fairley, please. Yes, please, convener. Thank you very much. Um, Michael, I'd just like to come back to you very quickly on the point you were just talking. The Civil Contingency Act was brought in during the foot and mouth um, outbreak in, in 2000, I think, and that was to stop people's access to the countryside, going on farms, and et cetera, et cetera. Is that a UK Act, and does the Scottish Government have any access to that? Is it, i.e., is it reserved, or can the Scottish Government use the Civil Contingency Act? Let me just uh, call it up um, uh, so that I can answer uh, your your question. It's fairly uh, well. It was it, it was enacted in 2004, um, uh, and it covers all kinds of civil contingencies, not simply um, a. a Things like foot and mouth, and it wasn't directed specifically at foot and mouth. It was directed at all kinds of emergencies, and so, the, uh, indeed, uh, the meaning of emergency under the Act uh, is an event or situation which threatens serious damage to human welfare in a place in the United Kingdom, uh, an event or situation which threatens damage to the environment of a place in the United Kingdom or war terror, or terrorism, which threatens serious damage to the security uh, of the United Kingdom. And for the purposes of explaining that, um, it goes on to describe the loss of human life as being one of the causes or uh, features of this, um, a, a disruption to uh, services relating to health is another aspect uh, which uh, is clearly 
uh, in this and human illness or injury. Uh, so it, it could apply, <clears throat> one could argue, uh, to uh, the coronavirus situation, could have applied to the coronavirus situation. But I think in, in evidence to uh, perhaps the Constitution Committee of the House of Lords or the Public Administration Committee uh, in the House of Commons, Michael Gove explained that uh, the, uh, the Act had really only been uh, brought into effect uh, in, those, uh, in, in contemplation of something uh, larger than um, a, a, the, a, the, a virus, but rather more focused on war or uh, some other contingency like that. And so, so I think that the coronavirus leg legislation uh, is one thing which has been brought in specifically uh, for uh, the purposes of dealing with uh, COVID-19. Uh, the Civil Contingencies Act uh, has a much broader uh, spec, uh, uh, conspectus uh, and, and is uh, more applicable to other forms of disruption to uh, our uh, national life. Uh, is, it, uh, is it amendable by the Scottish Parliament? It's a UK piece of legislation, uh, and so therefore I think the answer would have to be not. Okay. Uh, I haven't checked Schedule 5 to the Scotland Act, but um, uh, I think perhaps civil contingencies are actually a reserved matter. Okay, because you, you've, you've just raised something that I hadn't thought about at all. I'd never even heard of the Civil Contingency Act. I assumed it was foot and mouth when you said it was early 2000s. But if the Civil Contingency Act is there, and what we currently have is Coronavirus Act, going back on what you said that after this is all done and dusted, we need to look at some kind of public emergency act. Coronavirus hasn't just affected people's health. So should it have been... Um, should it have been looked at in a, in a broader picture and use the Civil Contingency Act because it's affected business, it's affected freedoms, it's affected poverty, it's affected every aspect of society. So would it not have made more sense to use the Civil Contingency Act rather than a Health Act? It's possible to debate the merits of uh, which piece of legislation you deploy uh, for each and every kind of uh, uh, circumstance which, uh, and, and challenge which uh, the country faces. Um, so I, I, I think, um, I think it, it is likely that uh, somewhere uh, the uh, civil contingencies legislation was looked at and discounted as giving the UK government uh, and the devolved administrations uh, adequate powers to deal with what was recognised as a global threat uh, in very quick order. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, I, I think it was probably the right decision uh, to go for a standalone piece of legislation which dealt with the coronavirus, uh, which was comprehensive uh, and uh, dealt uh, uh, as much as possible uh, with the, uh, the types of problems which uh, the uh, uh, the governments, because uh, at that time uh, there was the four uh, four nations action plan in place uh, to deal uh, to to uh, cope with coronavirus, uh, and uh, the uh, the four nations uh, agreed uh, on the coronavirus act as being the first part of the building block, uh, with uh, the devolved administrations in uh, Scotland and Wales uh, taking on uh, more. In, in terms of legislation and, 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 and subordinate legislation uh, growing uh, exponentially uh, across uh, all the, uh, the aspects of, of uh, uh, the restrictions uh, on movement and, and, uh, and, and other things as well. Uh, and so I, I think it's fair to say that, that uh, it was the right thing to do uh, and that the, the Con Civil Contingencies Act probably it was thought about and discounted for the reason that it, it was not as broad-based, didn't uh, provide adequate powers to uh, the governments uh, operating in uh, throughout the UK, uh, and uh, and I think that that's probably a reason why. Really, I'm, I'm being an absolute pedant here, and I apologise. If we had gone down the civil 
Contingency Act, would it not have been the same principle that those powers would have been devolved for the period of time to the devolved uh, administrations to allow them to use it? Well, the Civil Contingencies Act, uh, um, we're taking us off, uh, off the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the topic of the day, but the Civil Contingencies Act, I think it was created with a, a different perspective uh, on uh, the challenge which might be faced. And uh, sure enough, uh, parts of the Act uh, uh, are um, uh, usable in, uh, you know, there, there is a way in which uh, the, uh, the Act divides up uh, the issues of urgency, uh, consultation, enforcement, uh, etc. Uh, and uh, the, the use of emergency powers uh, is uh, something which uh, can be uh, determined by a senior minister of the Crown. Um, uh, but uh, I, I think that it, it would take... Uh, you would essentially be rewriting the Civil Contingencies Act to take account of coronavirus, and you would end up with the coronavirus legislation um, if you were to try to um, modify the Civil Contingencies Act to make uh, clear uh, which authorities were, be, uh, were being empowered to do uh, what and what powers were being given. Uh, so I think that, that uh, it was probably the right decision uh, to go uh, with the specific coronavirus legislation uh, and uh, to deal with that uh, in the way in which it has been dealt with, uh, which was on uh, originally on a four nations legislation uh, piece in the Coronavirus Act of 2020, uh, and uh, yet allowing the devolved administrations, and particularly in Scotland, uh, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament, uh, to make law uh, which was specific to Scotland, which dealt with amendments to Scottish law in the devolved sphere, uh, and uh, we can, uh, can cite examples of that in relation to uh, uh, movement in and around Scotland, um, uh, movement out of Scotland, uh, the, uh, the questions about uh, the way in which uh, the, uh, the courts operated, uh, the questions about uh, other things as well. Uh, so I think that it's, it, we would have ended up in the same place in one respect, but uh, the, the right answer was chosen to enact legislation specific to the threat of coronavirus. Sorry, can I just ask, Mr. Fairley, is this in relation, your next question in relation to the self isolation bill? No, I'm going to ask uh, Sandra. Um, sorry, not Sandra. Um, Susan, you had 100 respondents to 4,000 people that you sent a questionnaire out to. Um, and I'm absolutely not disputing the fact that we've got to get our message and everything better. But the fact that you only had 100 respondents, did you get the 100 respondents who didn't get it and 500 did? How, how would you know how many people aren't getting it? Because in Aberdeen, we've got 3,234 respondents and a 54% success rate, which isn't high enough. I absolutely accept that. So why was your respondent rate so low? I think it was so low because everybody else has got everything else going on at the moment. It is a busy period, especially for women uh, who have had the, the joys of having to homeschool, that have had to make sure that they were caring for other family members during this time, because these always predominantly land on women. And for the ones that, are, that responded to us, I think they were most upset about not getting the grant because of the situation it put them in. So I think the reason it was low is because other women were doing other things uh, and they weren't even aware like that was a, a grant to even claim. So we think it was a low response because basically we, we send it out there and we just take in what we can. So we went out to our networks and asked other women as well from different organisations uh, what their information they were getting back. So although it was 100 women that responded to the survey, it's probably because of everything else that's been going on. Quite a lot of our, our women members are, are like teachers, their parents, uh, they're older adults, and some of them don't have the technology to be able to answer the surveys for us. 
uh, and that's a huge issue. Obviously, the Scottish Women's Convention are trying everything we can to reach as many women as possible. But when some of the women in the islands and highlands haven't got broadband, we can't get their views uh, as readily as what we would be able to. And we didn't have the support at the time to be able to phone to get more respondents to actually give us that information. But I think the ones that we did get, uh, I think it was because they had had a negative effect with that and wanted us to be aware so that we could pass that on to the Scottish Government and the health boards, because they were from different health boards and different health boards had different outcomes. Uh, one of them, one woman was in Western Bartonshire, another one in Glasgow, and they had totally different ways of which they were dealt with with their health board. So it just goes to show the parity as well with who's dealing with you, because Aberdeen sounds as if they're getting it right. And from what we hear, Glasgow are doing quite well as well, getting that message out there and informing people that there is a grant there for them uh, to be able to to get. But that there's other uh, other health and social care partnerships that aren't maybe doing as well, but that might be to do with it regards to the way the NHS is running in those areas, if they are at capacity because of COVID and coronavirus. And I think quite a, the women, quite a lot of the women that are part of the Scottish Women's Convention are aware of that. Uh, the NHS is to be protected, and, and some of them did not want to even apply because they knew it was going to take vital time away from other things for the NHS. So that, that was another reason that was given to us. So that, okay. that's just uh, some of the background information on that. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Brian Whittle, please. Thank you, convener. Good morning to the panel. I'll, I'll think I'll be reasonably brief because a lot of the points I wanted to cover have already been spoken about. But I think the, the self-isolation grant is there um, to ensure that the that, uh, uh, or encourage people to, to actually self-isolate and that they're not put into a position where they have to make a decision whether or not they, they self isolate or or, or or pay the pay the bills. So, with that in mind, there's a couple of points I was going to ask Susan McKellar. You you, you talked around earlier on around um, the impact on on those who are on zero zero hours contracts or or, or part time work, where the, their inability to work would perhaps be felt most keenly. Do they have to? Uh, they have an issue around having to prove loss of income um, in in those particular circumstances. And does that then cause a difficulty in accessing the grant? Because at the end of the day, it's, it's ease of access to the grant. And also, there, you also mentioned those who perhaps are not within the criteria uh, for the grant, but maybe perhaps their income versus expenditure is a finely balanced, uh, 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 as many of us are, uh, is, is finely balanced. And the, their inability to work or go, or go into, uh, would would uh, uh, seriously impact their ability to pay their bills. So is the scope of the, the scope of this uh, grant wide enough as well? Yeah, uh, we don't think it is with regards to real term and what people are losing uh, money wise. With regards to women that were on zero hour, zero hour contracts, what they said to us it was. Because of that precarious work, even if they were to isolate for the 10 days and, and they didn't get that because they couldn't, they were then going to be affected by shifts going forward as well. Uh, some of these employers are very unscrupulous and they don't use employment law the way they should and the workers aren't protected. And, and that was something that came up about unions because we spoke to women about being part of unions, especially with, with zero-hour contracts. And it, it was about the fact that that costs money, even though it's quite low, and they don't want to rock the boat because that might stop them getting shifts in the future, uh, which would have a serious impact. And it was that, like some of the women who had been told to self-isolate self would isolate, but then they were getting pressure from employers to hurry up and get back to work because they were short-staffed. So you're getting that kind of impact as well, which then has that psychological impact on the person saying, I need to try and get back to work as soon as I can. You're not entitled to a grant. You're not getting that money. It puts that pressure on for you to, to break that isolation. And I think we need to look at that as well. Uh, but I think we do need to look at the income with regards to the zero hour contracts, because some weeks they could get 32 hours and other weeks they could get eight. And so we need to look at how Overall, their income generally runs like you would do, I think the government do with regards to tax credits. You, you're paid for so much. If that goes up, that reduces that kind of idea. 
Uh, and I think we need to look at that when we're looking at that grant, and especially for women who are on that breadline. If being isolated is going to cause them to, in real terms, not achieve that living minimum income that they need, then they should be entitled to get that grant. And that, that should be something in there that they're able to claim for that and prove that that is the case. Thank you. Just, just a, a very uh, final quick question there, there probably to, to Sandra McLeod around the, the impact on the health boards uh, of uh, the self-isolation um, uh, bill. How, how is that impacting on, 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 uh, on your health board? Within the health board specifically, yes. um, with regard to the grants? Yes. Um, so th the previously, I, I have checked that there, there was previously not a huge um, uptake for the 2008 Act, as was said previously. The Act um, and the grants are actually managed through the local authorities. The people will be informed through contract tracing. So that's just something. So, so when people are contacted to say that they have to require to isolate, the contact tracers will advise them and see, say, do you need assistance? Do you need to advise them of the grants? They'll make them then link to the local authority. So the impact on the health board at this stage would not have been um, would not be significant in a positive way. If, the, if it wasn't in place, the workload and, and, the, and the effect and the distraction to be able to claim and to process all of that payments would have had quite a significant effect on the health board. This has, in a way, been positive and has allowed us to really work with key partners across the system. So it's allowed our local authority colleagues, our health board colleagues, um, and then linking into our third sector to really have that community and um, you know public community planning approach to this. So I would say. Um, just to summarise, we'd say that no minimal impact on the health board, which is how it was intended, and which is a positive impact on then on the health boards being able to deliver their services. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does any other members have any more questions? No. Okay. I'd like to thank the witnesses for their evidence and giving us their time this morning. If witnesses would like to raise any further evidence with the committee, they can do so in writing, and the clerks will be happy to liaise with you about how to do this. Thank you very much. I briefly suspend the meeting, meeting to allow a changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
Good morning. We shall now move to agenda item number two. The committee will take evidence from the Scottish Government on the latest ministerial statements on COVID-19 and subordinate legislation. I will start by saying a few words about the draft Health Protection Coronavirus Requirements Scotland Amendment No. 4, Regulations 2021. Last week, the Minister of Parliamentary Business asked to speak to me about the changes to the COVID vaccination certification scheme outlined by the First Minister on the 23rd of November. At this meeting, the Minister explained that the Government is mindful of the concern expressed by this committee and the DPLR committee about the use of the made affirmative procedure. The Government has therefore suggested an approach whereby an expedited affirmative procedure might be used on this occasion and members will have seen from the correspondence from the Minister of Parliamentary Business explaining the Government's position. On this occasion, I was minded to accept this suggestion. This means that the regulations were formally laid on Monday and were considered by the DPLR Committee on Tuesday. Following its consideration of the regulations, the DPLR Committee has written to this committee and members have a copy of that correspondence. Following our consideration of the regulations this morning, the regulations will be taken to the Chamber at decision time later today. While I was minded to agree to the expedited timetable for scrutiny proposed by the Scottish Government on this occasion, this should not be viewed as setting a precedent for scrutiny going forward. This is something that we could keep under review. I would like to welcome to the meeting our witnesses from the Scottish Government, John Swinney, Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for COVID Recovery, Professor Jason Leach, National Clinical Director, and Elizabeth Sadler, Deputy Director of COVID Ready Society, Scottish Government. Thank you for your attendance this morning. Deputy First Minister, would you like to make any remarks before we move on to questions? Um, thank you, Convener. I'm grateful to the Committee for the opportunity to discuss a number of matters, including updates to Parliament this week and last week on COVID-19 and the instruments to which you have just referred. Um, as set out by the, Prime, the First Minister on Tuesday, while case numbers in Scotland have continued to fall, the emergence of the Omicron variant is deeply worrying and requires a proportionate and precautionary response. There are now confirmed cases of Omicron in Scotland and Public Health Scotland are working hard to identify any and all cases as quickly as possible. There are indications that Omicron may be more transmissible than the Delta variant, which is currently dominant in Scotland. Although at present there is no evidence to indicate that the disease caused by Omicron is more severe than that caused by other variants. Our understanding of the new variant is developing and we will know more, especially regarding the protection offered by vaccines in the days and weeks ahead, thanks to the dedication of scientists across the world. Although I very much hope that our level of concern will reduce in coming weeks, our precautionary approach is the right one for now. As the First Minister set out on Tuesday, at this stage we are not introducing additional health protection measures beyond some necessary travel restrictions. Instead, we are asking everyone to renew their focus on following existing protections. We need people to wear face coverings where required, maintain good hygiene, work from home wherever possible, ventilate indoor spaces and test themselves regularly. These protections are especially important as cold weather and the possibility of festive gatherings mean that we may be spending more time inside with other people. This week, the JCVI updated its advice, which means at least one million more people are now eligible for booster vaccines. This is good news as we know that vaccines are effective and save lives. Indeed, according to a study published last week by the World Health Organization, there may be more than 27,000 people in Scotland who are alive today only because of the vaccines. With over 88% of the adult population having had two doses of the vaccine and over 93% one dose, Scottish ministers now consider it proportionate to amend the certification scheme to include negative test results. This change will make it possible for people who cannot be vaccinated or, are not yet, or who are not yet fully protected and individuals who receive a vaccine not recognised by the MHRA to be able to attend venues covered by the scheme. The Health Protection Coronavirus Requirements Scotland Amendment No. 4 Regulations 2021 make the necessary amendments to the COVID-19 certification scheme. With effect from 5am on Monday the 6th of December, the scheme will allow people to show a record of a negative test for coronavirus taken in the 24 hours previous to attending a venue as an alternative to proof of vaccination. 
Certification continues to play a role in helping us to increase vaccine uptake to reduce the risk of transmission of coronavirus, to alleviate pressure on our health and care services and to allow higher risk settings to continue to operate as an alternative to more restrictive measures such as capacity limits, early closing times or closure. I am very happy to answer questions from the committee. Thank you very much, Deputy First Minister. I will now turn to questions. Can I re remind members and witnesses that we are restricted for time and each member has around eight minutes each. If I can start for the first question. Deputy First Minister, the reason for us agreeing to the expedited timetable for the Scottish Government's view that the regulations require to come into force on the 6th of December. For the record, could you please explain why the Scottish Government considers that the 6th of December and not another date is when these regulations should come into force? Essentially, Convener, we want to ensure that the regulations are in place um, to facilitate um, a, an increased level of protection and assurance in the run-up to the festive period. Um, obviously, from the 6th of December onwards, um, people will be engaged in the activities that uh, are habitually associated with Christmas, with retail and um, hospitality opportunities, and therefore putting in place the regulations at a moment where we are um, preparing for such events is the pragmatic approach that the government wants to take to, to maximise protection uh, and to maximise the involvement of members of the public in the, in, the, in the assurance that we're trying to create. Thank you very much. In light of the new um, variant and also trying to suppress transmission, I have a comment and a question from members of the public. Um, one of the comments is, I work as a symptomatic COVID-19 tester. My colleagues and I find it shocking that people who come for testing will arrive with families and friends in tow. Sometimes we get full car loads. Usually no one is wearing masks and it is obvious that they've been to a drive-in fast food outlet before attending for their test. We've been told that they are now had their test and they're taking their family out for lunch to cheer them up. This brings me to a question from Geraldine from South Ayrshire. What is being done to ensure people who self-isolate while symptomatic or waiting for test results as a message does not appear to be getting through? I think the, the, the importance of the... There's a number of points in, in, the, in the question and the scenario you put to me, Convener. Um, a, a key response is the necessity of ensuring that the baseline measures are habitually followed by everybody in all circumstances, whether one is going for a, a, a PCR test mm. or not. Um, there are baseline measures that are important that should be applied. So ensuring that um, people are wearing uh, face coverings in the appropriate settings to make sure that um, people are uh, following the basic hand hygiene measures. These are all absolutely critical at all times. And the government, as members will be familiar, the government is habitually in our public messaging in Parliament, but also in our um, in our wider uh, public messaging through television advertising, etc., are reinforcing those messages. The second point I would say is that when individuals are um, coming for PCR tests, um, the, the, the highest and greatest degree of care has got to be taken. Um, the, you know, the individuals who are coming for PCR testing, you know, if the whole car, in the scenario you put to me, if the whole car load, if a whole car load of people uh, from the same family are being tested, then it's quite understandable that everybody's in the car. But if if people are um, you know, I would encourage people only who need to go for PCR testing to go and um, certainly to observe all of the hygiene measures that are appropriate in those circumstances. Um, and then the, the final point I would say is that when it comes to observing the self-isolation requirements, the guidance could not be clearer um, or the requirements could not be clearer that when an individual... Um, if, for example, an individual um, has symptoms or has uh, and has caused to uh, secure a PCR test, or if they've undertaken a lateral flow test and have tested positive, that should that should instantaneously bring about a change in behaviour. 
because that person is potentially infectious. And therefore, every bit of care has to be taken in relation to the movements of that individual, the observation of the, um, the restrictions that are appropriate uh, to make sure that they're minimising the risk of transmission. And, and, and I can assure the individuals who have contacted the committee that these messages are uppermost in the communications of the government. Thank you very much. I think it's really important that we reiterate the importance of the guidance and following it. Can I move on to Murdo Fraser? Thank you, Convener. Good, good morning, Cabinet Secretary um, and other witnesses. Um, we were discussing earlier the um, Omicron uh, variant and the impact that would have, and I think it's now generally understood that the best way to try and address this is to accelerate the booster programme. Um, we heard yesterday about a number of incidents of individuals who turned up at vaccination centres expecting to uh, be given the booster and were then turned away because it had been uh, less than 24 weeks since their second jab, which clearly was not in line with the new Scottish Government guidance. Has that issue now been resolved? Yes, uh, yes the issue has been resolved. Uh, I regret very much that uh, some individuals had the experience they had yesterday uh, because the, the guidance changed and uh, that, should have been, that should have been applied in all vaccination uh, centres and scenarios. So uh, in the light of uh, what emerged and what uh, I'm advised was a limited number of cases yesterday, um, we have reiterated the guidance to all health boards to ensure that all vaccination centres are operating to that new updated guidance, which of course only emerged at the start of this week. But uh, I, I regret the fact that some individuals were inconvenienced in the way that they were. Uh, obviously, the fact that people are so willing to come forward for the booster jags at such an early stage after the change of guidance is an indication of the public attitude to participate in the programme, which is welcome, which makes it uh, doubly disappointing that people were inconvenienced in the way that they were. Okay, thank you. That, that, that's, that's very helpful. Um, I mean, you've just referenced the fact there'll be substantially increased demand now for boosters. I think the public will expect this. They'll be seeing the news headlines around the Omicron variant and be concerned about that. Therefore, there'll be a lot of extra demand. Is this capacity in place, therefore, to respond to that demand? And what steps are being taken to increase that capacity, particularly over the coming weeks? In terms of the capacity of uh, vaccines, uh, yes, the capacity is there. There's no issue with, with that. Uh, obviously, we have to go through the process of vaccination in an orderly fashion to make sure it can be done efficiently. And we are, uh, we've already expanded uh, significantly the availability of vaccines as part of the programme. Um, obviously, the change in JCVI guidance on Monday increases the number of people who are then eligible for a booster vaccination at this particular moment. So that creates, uh, if, if my memory serves me right, I think an additional 1.3 million individuals immediately become eligible. Now, obviously, I think colleagues will understand that we can't, we can't vaccinate 1.3 million people in, in, in one day. So we, we have to increase capacity to move through that as efficiently as we possibly can do. And that work is underway to ensure that we are um, satisfying that understandable demand that there will be within the community. Now, I'm confident that we will be in a position to administer all of... You know, we, we, prior to the GCVI guidance, we were confident that all eligible individuals would be able to secure their uh, booster vaccination before the turn of the year. Um, we, are, uh, we are confident that with the new JCVI guidance in place, we will be able to reach that point um, by the end of January. Uh, so obviously there will be a period of time where people um, will have to wait some weeks to secure their, 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 their booster JAG. But they will certainly be getting it earlier than would have been the case in any other circumstances uh, if, for example, they'd had to wait six, uh, uh, 24 weeks after the, um, uh, the second vaccination that they received. OK, thank you. That's, that's very helpful. C can I just ask about the connection between the, the booster jab and the, the flu jab? 
because many people, including over 50s, which you and I, Cabinet Secretary, will fall into that category, um, have been invited for, for boosters and getting the flu jab at the same time. But in some cases, that means they won't be getting an appointment until January. Is that a risk? Because we're, you know, the, 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 the peak flu danger season presumably is early January. So the fact that we might not be getting a flu, a flu jab till January, does that not create an additional risk for people? I think there's a, there's a, I'll bring in uh, Professor Leach on, on some of these questions because we get into the, 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 the assessment of clinical risk. But I think if I perhaps, if I perhaps explain the thinking behind the program, um, essentially we, we took a decision this year to vaccinate more people than ever before for flu along uh, and we also whilst we had a commitment to administer the booster jags for a, a range of population groups and um, our judgment was that the most effective and efficient way of doing that was to as far as possible combine the flu and covid booster vaccination programs uh, to ensure that we uh, were using resources wisely we were calling people in when they could get two um, two doses together um, i had my flu and booster jag on sunday in a very efficient program um, in in blurgowry town hall um, and uh, the, the, the program is designed to try to make as much progress as possible. Now, obviously, there will be some individuals who are getting a flu jag probably slightly later in the year than they would have got it on a standalone program arrangement. Um, uh, and uh, the, the, Professor Leach can set out the, the clinical issues around about that, but. I think what we are trying to do is to maximise the protection that's available to individuals and the protection that's available within society in as efficient a programme as we possibly can do. Uh, although I do accept that for some individuals, they may get a flu vaccination slightly later than they would ordinarily have received it. Yeah, yeah. DFM is, is right. A couple of things about flu. There isn't any just now, so no panic. So nobody, nobody needs to worry yet about catching flu. There's single-figure numbers across the whole country. Uh, I don't anticipate that will last. And the flu season is later than we think it is in our heads. Most people think flu comes with the winter. It does, but it takes a bit of time. So the flu, the real flu season for hospitals is into the new year, is into January, February, March, April. So, it, so it's not usually November and December. There are exceptions in the year, but th this year is not. And, and it may be we're going to get away with fewer numbers than we usually get, and that would be fantastic because the hospitals could really live without more respiratory disease, frankly. It, we'll need to make a judgment about when we start to call people for flu who have now had COVID, because the COVID appointments have now shifted. So, so people who were expecting to get COVID and flu in January, that probably stays. But then if you're getting COVID in March, I would expect you to go for your flu vaccine before then. And each board will make a judgment. Now that we've changed, the Joint, the joint Committee has given advice, we've changed the operational plans. Part of those operational plans are the flu vaccinations. So we'll now shift some of them forward, backwards. It may be actually we can do more joint than we thought because we were going to bring people in and then, so that will all get sorted out at board level and people will be told. If people are confused or worried about it, they can talk to their own GP. They may well not vaccinate them, but they can at least reassure them about where they are in that, in that process and the risk they're facing. Thank you. Have we got time for one more question? Come here. Could, could I pick up, I mean, Deputy First Minister, you said there that the, the capacity is there, there are no issues with that. I noticed the, a tweet there just as, I was, as you came in that for somebody in Kirkcaldy who says, turned away for my COVID booster in Kirkcaldy this morning, seems the message still hasn't filtered down, wouldn't have been a big deal, but the place was deserted. And it's this question about the mismatch between what government is saying in this place and what's happening out there. Tuesday night, I went along to the, the drop-in centre at Dunfermline. Uh, it was open for five to eight. I'd queued for about 40 minutes, so got to the, the, the front door of the vaccine centre about 25 past, at which point the staff announced that there were an R50 still waiting inside. 
and uh, they were going to have to stop. And I was lucky they got in. It was about 40 turned away. You know, that, that doesn't suggest the capacity is there. But, but more importantly, once in, the staff told me that, that one, they had had to put up with quite a bit of abuse because of the massive long queues. The staff were brilliant. They were clearly, they'd never lifted their heads for the whole evening. And what they were saying is it's fine for politicians to stand up in Edinburgh and tell people to go and get their boosters, but if we haven't got the staffing in place, we're not prepared for that. There's a clear mismatch and a struggle. So where are we at? We at? Well, I think, I think there are, obviously there are a phenomenal number of operational issues about the, the, the running of a programme of this magnitude. And we've got, I think we've got to bear in mind the numbers here. You know, we've now past 10 million vaccinations yeah. that have been undertaken. It's a colossal undertaking that's been achieved as part of this programme. Um, and, and I pay tribute to the, the staff who are delivering the vaccinations, but also those organising these programmes, because it's not, it's not a simple logistical exercise. There's a number of points in Mr Rowley's um, question to me which I think need to be addressed. The first, the first one is in relation to the, the, the tweet that Mr Rowley has just raised with me. Um, we have reiterated the guidance to health boards. Um, it is important that that guidance is applied in all scenarios and circumstances on the ground. So, obviously, um, I will take away the fact that there has been a, an example raised with me where that message has clearly not reached um, the, um, uh, the, uh, all of the distribution points for the vaccination programme. Um, uh, but obviously, we have had a change of circumstances of the advice, which is relatively new, so it, it does take time for these messages to get across, but I'll make sure that's taken up. The, the second point is really in relation to the capacity questions, and when I answered Murdo Fraser, I said that you know, there was certainly capacity in terms of the availability of vaccines, there's you know, adequate provision of vaccines. Uh, the question will be about the the best means of um, administering that programme at a local level. And, of course, there's a whole range of different options about how we might go about doing that. There are, uh, th there are probably, I suppose, three main options. There is drop-in, there is um, self-selection of appointment by the online portal, and there's uh, the setting of appointments by letter by health boards. Now, if we want to make, obviously, if we set letters, and, and with each option, there's upsides and downsides. Setting letters out gives an order and an organisation to the programme. The downside is that it takes time to get all that infrastructure put in place to administer and distribute the letters, and also there is, you know, quite a reasonable level of do not attends on the, the appointments that get put out. Uh, we have opted for the portal option in, in some circumstances. The portal option gives um, the choice to people to select their appointment. I was able to choose Blair Gowrie Town Hall on Sunday morning, suited me down to the ground, and I got my vaccination. Um, but there are, for some people, digital access is a bit of a, is a challenge. For other people, um, they may um, they may find that there aren't appointments to, to, to suit their, their choices. And then drop-in is, um, can be, as Mr Rowley has recounted, can be quite challenging if, if too many people decide to drop in at the one time. Mr Rowley cited the Kirkcaldy vaccination centre this morning where the member of the public who's tweeted said it was, it was quiet. The one that Mr Rowley went on Tuesday night in Dunfermline was very busy. So, the, the smoothing of demand is quite difficult in a drop-in only system. So what we've tried to opt for is a means of balancing out the best of those if we possibly can do. When I went on Sunday morning for my vaccination, there was a couple behind me who were drop-in candidates. They got taken in the, you know, they weren't put into a different, a different queue or anything. They were right in the queue behind me and they got taken just right after me. Um, so we're trying to, to, to work we're trying to work through every possible practical permutation to maximise the amount of access that we can have in place. Because obviously, 
If there are 1.3 million people who are now eligible for a, a vaccine and they all decide to turn up for a drop-in vaccination service today, then there will not be adequate places to enable all 1.3 million to be vaccinated. But we're trying to balance that programme over the country with a number of different mechanisms to enable us to maximise um, a participation in the vaccination programme. There's, there's a lot we don't know about this latest variant, but what we seem to know is that the evidence coming out of South Africa is, is in terms of how quickly it spreads, it is a massive worry to, to, to all scientists. The evidence seems to be there that this thing can spread much more than the Delta variant, which in itself at the time was bad. Given that, given the fact that, that people are queuing up for boosters and being turned away because, because the capacity doesn't exist, do you not think the government need to look health board by health board, look at what is in place and what needs to be put in place? The health secretary the other day was basically on the, the radio telling people that the, there wasn't enough staff and there wouldn't be enough staff because you can't bring staff to all other parts of the NHS. But what, what needs to be done? What other professions could be brought in and trained quickly to be able to support this? What we need is a mass vaccination, surely, to happen as quickly as possible. And that's only based on the evidence that we've seen today. Well, we, 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 do, have, we do have a mass vaccination programme. We have a mass capacity underway. You know, we are vaccinating. We're distributing about uh, in excess of 60,000 vaccinations on a daily basis in Scotland today. We are the most vaccinated part of the United Kingdom, with the highest levels on all first, second, third, first, second, third, and booster vaccinations. So we have a very comprehensive mass vaccination programme. The government is looking health board by health board. Health boards have submitted their plans to government about how they can um, intensify the vaccination programme, and that dialogue continues between the government and health boards to maximise that capacity because this is a you know this is a program that's got to take place in a whole variety of different geographies around the country in different scenarios. So I assure Mr Rowley that we are trying to maximise the capacity of the vaccination programme. But Mr Rowley also has to accept from, from me that there is a challenge and just in the two pieces of, of evidence and information that Mr Rowley has given the committee highlight the challenge. You've got the Kirkcaldy Vaccination Centre today, this morning, I presume before 11 o'clock in the morning, quite quiet. And you've got the Dunfermline Vaccination Centre at 5 o'clock at night, 5 to 8 at night, very, very busy. In a sense, that illustrates the challenge of operating a programme, which is, you know, we're providing capacity where in Kirkcaldy this morning, drop-in appointments could be fulfilled because it was quiet. Um, but in Dunfermline on a Tuesday night, it becomes ever more problem problematic. So I would assure Mr Rowley that every step has been taken to maximise. Now, Professor Leach has been involved in work to expand the pool of individuals coming forward to operate the vaccine, to deliver the vaccines. I'll ask him to say a little bit about that in a moment. But what I would also say is that um, the, 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 the number of people who are coming forward from within the health service to administer the vaccination programme, the more we draw in people from other disciplines, the more we will have to address the issue of what other services the National Health Service can deliver. So if we've got if we draw in other healthcare staff who are delivering um, elective activity to deliver the vaccination programme, then we obviously reduce the capacity for the elective work of the National Health Service. And, and I know how much that matters to, to members of the public and to members of Parliament, that we try to do as much elective work as we can. But perhaps Jason Leach can give some more detail. You've, you've covered it really well. It's a real balance, Mr Rowley. We are, for context, we're vaccinating faster than we've ever vaccinated in history. We're vaccinating the fastest any country in the world is vaccinating across the whole of the UK, apart maybe last week from the Republic of Ireland. We, we have put out recruitment calls from every board for anybody who can come and help us, from medical students through to optometrists and dentists. I did a 
private visit to Greater Glasgow and Clyde's HR department earlier this week, which is in the old York Hill Hospital, just to thank them and uh, meet them. And they uh, have been overwhelmed by a new set of recruitment individuals who have come forward from the most recent advert. It takes a, takes a little bit of time to get those people on board, depending on their history and whether they've done vaccination before or whether they're a clinician or a student. That, that's going very well, and they will put those, they will put those people into the uh, shifts as quickly as we possibly can. Glasgow, for instance, has vaccination centres throughout the city and the broader health board going every day. Drop-in clinics are awkward for us, for the very reason you've just described. We, we would rather logistically have people appointed, and then we know that they're going to come and there's an order with which we can do it, and then we can plan the next what is effectively two months to vaccinate these one to two million individuals with, with the COVID booster. The only other thing I'd say, and it's, it's Mr Fraser and you, and it, you're both right that vaccination is, in Mr Fraser's words, the best way to fight Omicron. It is not the only way to fight Omicron. It's really important that we don't just think about... I know that's not what you're suggesting, but we shouldn't just think about vaccination. Of course we need to do it, and we need the tens of thousands of people who are doing it today in vaccination centres, both staff and citizens. But we also need to think about how we protect the population and ourselves from Omicron in, in other ways, as well as just vaccination. Can we move on to Jim Fairley, please? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, good morning, gentlemen and lady. Um, I'm going to talk about um, vaccine uptake and where there is a bit of hesitancy, and it's from questions that we're getting from the public to the committee, and it's vaccine in women's reproductive health and breastfeeding. Uh, a number of people have been in touch regarding women's health and the vaccine, and some are asking if fertility has impacted. I know we've covered this before, but if we're getting the questions, then clearly the message still hasn't got out to some individuals. Um, some are asking if fertility is impacted in any way of having the vaccine. Others have asked if breastfeeding women will be eligible for the booster vaccine and if the health and social care partnerships midwife, midwives have appropriate information and training on eligibility for the vaccine. Um, parents have highlighted inconsistency in knowledge and understanding across um, HSBCs in Scotland in relation to breastfeeding and vaccine eligibility. And I'm going to add one more for yourself, Jason, if you don't mind. I've got a, a constituent who's very concerned about getting the vaccine because she's on cancer drugs. So we can answer that in the round. I think it would best if First Leach responded to that. Let me be as blunt as you would expect. There is no contraindication to the vaccine if you are pregnant or breastfeeding at all. There is no biologically plausible mechanism for the vaccine to cause you any more challenge than if you weren't pregnant or not breastfeeding. Is that blunt enough for them? The Royal Co if you don't believe me, you can head to the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology, the Royal College of Paediatrics, any trusted source of clinical information, including our own NHS Inform. Young Scott has some really good information for our young people to help them make those choices. The other thing is, it's really important that, that we don't suggest that vaccination is always an easy choice for people. So the vaccination centres don't force you to be vaccinated. In fact, one of the reasons to go to a vaccination centre might be to have that conversation. And you can leave unvaccinated. No, nobody's going to force you to be vaccinated. And the best people to have that conversation with you may well be the senior clinicians who are in that vaccination centre in Kirkcaldy or Dunfermline or wherever. And they are well equipped. And if the individual you first meet isn't able to answer your more technical question for cancer drugs, for example. We have escalation processes in place in the centre and on phones to even more senior immunologists and virologists and others where we would be able to get all the information you would require. There are tiny numbers of people who we'd have to reappoint in a specialist centre and think about that, but that would be very small numbers. Your patient with cancer medication, it depends entirely what it is. If it's long term, probably no risk, but the best answer for them is to talk to their care team that's looking after them and they'll be able to point them in the right direction. It's vanishingly rare for you not to be able to be vaccinated, even during cancer care. It's vanishingly rare, but there are some, so we should just check with their care team if it's safe for them to be vaccinated. 
as I said, I know we've been over this before, but it's worth re-emphasising. We, we are seeing a number of pregnant women across the UK fall ill with COVID, mm -hmm. and, and proportionately more than we would expect if it were random. So we are seeing pregnant women, both in the UK and around the world, falling ill with COVID because they are choosing not to be vaccinated. And that's a much, much bigger danger than the vaccine. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Brian Mitchell. Good morning. Um, thank you, Kavina. Uh, good morning, uh, Deputy First Minister, Professor Leach and uh, Ms Adler. Um, I... Uh, uh, this morning, when we were speaking to, to um, some of our, our, our experts, I was suggesting that um, the, the emergence of Omicron was expected uh, and the mutations of a virus were expected. And, and I was, the question that I was lining I was going to go down was how are we going to manage uh, going, uh, the, this process going forward because it will be a continual process. And the re response we got was that, that Omicron actually was uh, matches the worst case scenario modelling that they had done, which is really what I didn't want to hear, uh, to be quite honest. And yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. So, so it kind of changed the, the 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 way in which I was going to ask the questions. But with that in mind, you know, the the, the scientific and medical communities are obviously examining currently the impact on transmission, severity of condition, and and vaccination effectiveness. Can I ask? How are you considering measures um, uh, that need to be taken with, with uh, while we're waiting for that, given, as, as uh, one of my colleagues said, is the likelihood is there's increased transmission rates with the, 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 the consequent stress, potential stress on the NHS, I think we heard that South Africa have gone from a few hundred cases a day to over 8,000 within two weeks. And it will be, it's going to be a little bit of time till we find out exactly the impact. So where, where, where are we with that, with that thought process? The, 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 these, frankly, are the fundamental dilemmas that we wrestle with all the time. It's why, in my opening remarks, um, I used the words that we were taking um, a, a proportionate and precautionary approach to handling the situation. We, we have... Um, there is modelling that is undertaken uh, on our regular basis of the likely course of the pandemic. It looks at a variety of variables. If we go back a few weeks, it was looking at the potential impact of, uh, of COP. Um, it looks at the impact of winter. It looks at all sorts of scenarios. And it gives um, um, a, essentially a central, a better and a worse scenario based on prevalence and circulation of the virus. Obviously, we hope for better, we prepare for central, and we hope that we don't reach worse. Um, but we are prepared to take, uh, obviously, different sets of actions are required if we are facing the better or the worst scenario rather than the central. And that's why I use the word proportionate in, in our judgment. But the precautionary one is important as well. So at this stage, if we look at the pandemic today in Scotland, um, case numbers are high, but fairly flat. They're actually, they're actually comparatively speaking, seven, the last seven days are slightly down on the previous seven days in numbers of cases. Um, the level of hospitalisation of COVID patients today is slightly lower than it was, still over 700. So if we didn't have those 700 people in hospital with COVID, we could be doing other treatments for people that, for those 700 patients. So there's a, a very careful judgment to be made about what are the proportionate steps to be taken. Now, the, if uh, Omicron turns out to be more transmissible than Delta, then what that will say to us is that there will be more cases. Um, if the level of serious illness is no different to Delta, then we will be hospitalising um, a relatively small proportion of percentage of the cases, but that will be a larger number of people if the number of cases are higher. That is when the pressure comes on. That, that's when... The, the, the even more pressure comes on the National Health Service and when services become under pressure. Because although 
we, the, the level of seriousness of illness may not change, but the volume changes significantly, that's when we have to take more dramatic action. Now, today, I don't have a justification for doing that because I can look at the scenario about Omicron, but I don't have, I can't put out the, com the compelling evidence base that says we need to do the following more severe measures because that evidence base doesn't yet exist, but it may well exist, if you, and that's what the government keeps under review on a constant basis. So your expert is correct. Down a microscope, this looks terrible. So it has, it has some of the mutations that we already know are linked to vaccine escape. It has some of the mutations that we know are linked to increased transmission. And it has some new ones, and we don't know what they do in rough terms. What we don't know is how it performs in the real world. We actually don't know if it can... Vi virologists talk about fitness of the virus to kind of summarise what it can do. We don't know in the long term if it's fitter than Delta. If it's fitter than Delta, it, we can only slow it. We can't stop it. We, it. It will overtake Delta for the world. And Delta has become the dominant virus around the world. So we have to do two things. And I, I think we've done them. We have to stop it coming. And when it's here, we have to manage it like we used to manage the original virus, if you remember, by trying to put a ring of steel around those cases. You remember first outbreaks in Cooper Angus, in Gretna, and so trying to really focus on those individual outbreaks. So we're really dealing with two simultaneous pandemics just now. The health protection teams are dealing with Delta in the way this committee fully understands, with restrictions, with testing, with vaccination. But at the same time, we're dealing with a new pandemic of Omicron in a, in a much more targeted way where we're going, we're doing enhanced contact tracing, we're doing enhanced PCR testing to try and control it. Now, if Omicron is better than Delta, we can only slow it down. We can't, we can't stop it. We can't, we can't hope that Delta stays and Omicron goes away. That will only happen if it is not as fit as Delta. And we need to know three things. We need to know transmissibility, severity of disease, and vaccine escape. We can tell some of that down the microscope, but most of it we need real world data. So if you have 10,000 Delta cases, 3% of them go to hospital, 1% of them die, roughly. What's the, what are those numbers for Omicron? Is it 3% and 1%? Or is it 4% and 2%? That's a massive difference, but we just can't tell. In South Africa, the early, the early signs are bad. So it took Delta 100 days in South Africa to be the dominant variant. It's taken Omicron 20. That would suggest increased transmissibility. Now, we don't know. They are much less vaccinated than us. They're a different, younger demographic than us. So you, so you can't make exact extrapolations to your context or the Japanese context or the Californian context. So we've, we need more time. And probably the sentence I say most often to the Deputy First Minister <laughs> on a daily basis is, I need more time. And we, sometimes we don't have time. You have to make, you have to make decisions in a, in a proactive way before, before you get all that data. I think, that, I think that, that last point, if I could just follow that up, Kavira, I think that, in a sense, is the completion of the argument about proportionality, that at some point we have to make a call which we think, on the basis of you know, the best uh, clinical assessment we can have around these three factors of vaccine escape, transmissibility, serious illness, that this is now the moment to act. And, you know, and, that, and that's a, a, I, I accept that there might not be all of the demonstrable evidence to to support such a conclusion, or, the, or the, the, the conclusive certainty. But that's the government's been making judgments of that type since March 2020. Thank you. I, th I think that's really helpful. It kind of um, leads me on to the, the, the point that I, I, I do raise um, uh, reasonably regularly. Um, and uh, it's around the, the idea that this committee is going to uh, look at an investigation into the excess deaths that we currently have uh, in Scotland, which is sitting about 12% above average, not all COVID-related. COVID and I suppose with the emergence of Omicron, this is even more acute, how you make these kind of decisions, in, in that you know, there is a mortality associated with other conditions that are non-COVID-related. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, you know, at some point, you know, we, we're going to have a look at it. I'm sure that the medical profession are looking at it much more deeply than we are. You know, I'm really looking at, again, I keep looking ahead, how do we get to a point where 
the, the balance uh, the, the balance it, it allows these conditions which have a mortality associated with them how do we get to get get that uh, or how do we see a route to get back to that that sort of uh, normality I, I I think this is it's a very significant question and a and a legitimate question into the bargain um, we um, in my answers to Mr Rowley I was making the point you know completely legitimate questions from Mr Rowley about expanding the scale of the vaccination programme. One of the options could well be to say, right, let's turn the dial down on elective work and let's put more work into, more resource into the vaccination programme. If we do that, without wishing to personalise this, but I shall, I shall use these distinguished members of Parliament to illustrate my point. Mr Rowley might be more happy, but Mr Whittle will not, because Mr Whittle's primary concern is about the, the, the treatment of, let's call them non-COVID uh, conditions, which are perhaps leading to early mortality because health services are not able to undertake all that we would ordinarily hope for them to be able to undertake. That is why we have to invest in all of the precautionary measures we possibly can do to avoid the circulation of the virus. Because we're not, we're not powerless about the circulation of Omicron. We're not powerless in any shape or form because people can come forward for their vaccinations, which of course they're doing, and they're doing in substantive numbers. People can observe the baseline measures on an absolutely routine rudimentary basis to try to put up those barriers to the circulation of the virus. Um, there's all sorts of steps that we can take to avoid our contact tracers who are doing like, it's absolutely incredible to watch what they're doing around these early cases on Omicron. Just quite jaw dropping the degree of intensity of looking for where people have been, who they've been close to, what is happening around it to try to, as much as possible, interrupt the circulation of the uh, the virus. Um, so there's a there's a whole variety of devices we've got to do, because the more we do that, the more we can address or have as much activity to try to address the core point that Mr. Whittle puts to me. Um, please. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Um, yeah, we could all do with more time. Um, on the point of the six months coming down to three months, I mean. I, I suppose I kind of thought, well, I've got, I've, I'm getting my booster vaccine in six months, so I'm quite safe for six months, and I got it on Friday. Um, but now it's three months. I mean, partly that sends out the message that actually you're at risk after three months. So um, uh, is the vaccine protection waning quicker than we thought? Um, are we going to have to get a vaccine every three months? I think there's a... I'm going to bring in Professor Leach because we're... Mm -hmm the clinical nature of some of these points. But I think there is, I think it would be fair to say, there is obviously going to be vaccine waning. So part of what we have seen in the course of the last few weeks was an increase in cases in the older age groups. You know, if we go back over the last two months, we saw an increase in the number of cases in the older age groups. And then when the booster vaccination programme started kicking in in those older age groups, that came down more aggressively than in other age groups. So I think what I would deduce from that, Professor Leach can tell me if I've got this wrong, but I would deduce from that that vaccine waning was taking place, but the booster arrested that and gave more protection. Now, but then the logic would be, let's do it after two months. Well, I, I think that, well, there'll, be, there'll be clinical points that will come out to, to, to because there may, there may not be a justification for so doing, because there may be sufficient vaccine protection for a sufficiently long period of time. It may be that six months, you know, this is a, this is a new disease. So clinicians and scientists are trying to work their way through what's the best answer. Their judgment has been six months. Um, it may be you know, that's been revised by JCVI to three months. Um, a tick fall from six to three. It is, but I think it's also a recognition of perhaps the necessity of taking some... When I go back to my two key, key words, proportionate and precautionary, 
in the light of Omicron, the precautionary stance of moving to an earlier time for the booster jag strikes me as being a rational consideration for the JCVI to arrive at. But so a, a few things. I'll try and be quick. So, so the, remember the JCVI advice is not before three months. It's not at three months. It's not before three months. Before, it was not before six months. So they know you can't do everybody on the Tuesday night. They release their news release. They're, they're, they're smart. So they know we're needing a bit of running time to get to everybody. So mine's on the 17th of December. That'll be 26 weeks. I could have brought that forward. I'm going to go on the 17th of December. I'm not, I'm not 10 days. I, I figure it's not going to make that much difference. I may live to regret that, but that's my present position. It, I'm going to try a metaphor. Uh, immunity is not like an on-off light switch, it's like a dimmer light switch. And I can't tell what your dimmer's doing and you can't tell what mine's doing. All I can tell at a population level, if you look at number of infections, number of hospitalizations, number of, across the whole world, and the vaccine you've used and how well it went and which age you did, the boffins can then say, oh, Scotland's dimmer has reduced. So we need to turn it back up again. And the way to turn it back up again is to boost oldest, youngest, all the way, all the way down. Now, they've got to take into account that we had a large gap between one and two. Israel didn't. They waned first. So it looks as though it wanes. Now, what will happen next is we'll watch the dimmer again. I, I would be very surprised, and the immunologists tell me this, that it will dim less the next time because your body remembers. So each time you get one, stays higher for longer because immunity is complicated. It's not just antibodies. There's also cells remembering things. So it may well be that the next booster might be a little bit further out and the next one again might be a little bit further out. Or you might say, we'll only do the elderly next time because young people, they've, their imprint has stayed on for longer. But that, that's all quite difficult because you've got to take serial blood tests from people to check they've got immunity and then you've got to watch the whole population to see how the dimmer is working. And if you need to turn that dimmer back up again, you vaccinate from the top to the bottom. But the vaccines to maybe give longer protection? We absolutely could, because principally around new variants. So if the vari variants, again, are not like a binary light switch. So Omicron will not escape the, va the vaccine completely, but it may be... It's, I'm completely guessing. It might be 60% protection rather than 95% protection, in which case you'd probably for next year want to adjust the vaccine. And the companies can do that, they say within 100 days, and then they can produce it, and we'd have it within probably six months of start to finish, approximately. So, so you're, you're back into making... The, so not only are you turning the dimmer up, you're making it more efficient. You can turn it up faster because you've got it against the one you wanted. Okay, thanks. Uh, metaphor, I think I overstretched it. but I'm just... No, I get, I get the point. Uh, that's helpful. It's not, uh, it's not black and white. It's pretty clear. Um, on the question of uh, certificates, vaccine certificates, I think on Monday, if I'm right, uh, negative tests are going to be allowed and possibly some other variations. Uh, will that appear on the app or the certificate? Um, the uh, the uh, lateral flow tests will not appear on the app, no. A, the lateral flow test won't. A, and what about the booster? A, because I've, got, I've had a constituent in touch saying that when he goes to Germany, they want to see a recent JAG. Yeah, the, 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 the app has been revised to include the booster um, JAGs, and we expect that to be completed and the update available in early December. Um, the, there is a, a, a critical date of the 15th of December when uh, I think a number of European countries will make it mandatory for booster jags to be evidenced on COVID vaccine certificates and uh, the update will be in place by then. Okay, thank you. And uh, sorry, uh, <coughs> the, the app will be updated for international travel and boosters um, from the 9th of December. It will take longer for the app to be updated to include boosters for domestic certification. This fits, the current domestic certification scheme defines fully vaccinated as having had two vaccines and doesn't include the it doesn't at the moment include the requirement for a booster and if i may my final question would be um what about children age 5 to 11 are we thinking of vaccinating them well we're uh, we, we're 
waiting advice on that point from the GCVI, and um, that is an issue which has been explored by the GCVI, and well, obviously, every week. Uh, and we, we will um, we'll obviously uh, look carefully to the recommendations that come from the GCVI in that respect. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. That concludes our consideration of this agenda item, and I'd like to thank the Deputy First Minister and his officials for their evidence today. I now move on to third agenda item, which is consideration of the motion on the expedited draft affirmative instrument considered during the previous agenda item. Members will note that SSI 2021 oblique 425 was laid on the 19th of November and we had intended to take the motion on this instrument at that meeting. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has decided to consider this, this instrument and it at its meeting next week, so we will defer consideration of that motion. Deputy First Minister, would you like to make any further remarks on the draft affirmative instrument on the vaccination certification scheme before we take the motion? No, convener. I'm satisfied with what I said. Thank you. I'd like to invite the Deputy First Minister to move motion S6M-02332. With the motion in my name, Kavina. Thank you. Can I have any comments from members? Meadow Fraser. Thank you. Thank you, Kavina. I'd, I'd hope to make this point um, in the earlier session, but time, time ran away with us. And it's really just to uh, draw to the uh, Deputy First Minister's attention the comments that have been raised with us by the DPLR committee who looked at this instrument uh, on Tuesday. The uh, instrument before us allows the use of a negative lateral flow test as an alternative to um, a vaccine certification for entry to certain premises. I think that's a, a welcome step. It's something that's been, been welcomed by the business community and brings Scotland into line with, uh, I think, most if not all other European countries who operate a vaccine passport scheme. The issue that DPLR committee raised, though, was, was the, the fact that this change effectively relies on individuals' honesty, because it is relatively easy for people, if they wanted to, uh, to uh, present a, a false negative test. And they raised the issue as to whether or not uh, that was something that had come into the, the government's consideration, and whether there was any thought about making the system more rigorous, for example, with the introduction of sanctions for people who, who presented a a false negative. And I don't know whether the Deputy First Minister can respond to that or if he has any thoughts on behalf of the government on that point. Well, um, can I just make a point, uh, Convener? It wouldn't be a false negative, it would be a fraudulent negative. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> the, uh, I think we've members of Parliament have wrestled with this question for some considerable time. Indeed, Mr Fraser is correct that a number of members of Parliament, including himself, have pressed the Government to take this step for some time. And, of course, the Government has indicated that what we wanted, well, we wanted a scheme to be in place that would primarily assist in the uh, boosting of vaccine take-up, which is why we resisted this particular move to begin with because it didn't suit the purpose of our scheme. Uh, we did at the same time indicate that the risk that Mr Fraser puts to me was a risk. Um, so just for the completeness of the argument, uh, I would put that, to, um, to, to, I'd put that on the record. There is a risk here, I, I can't deny it. Um, um, the, but I do hope that members of the public, it's part of the culture that we as a society have to take forward if we are serious as a society about trying to resist the spread of the virus, that we test ourselves and we follow what either the one or the two red lines say to us when the test is completed. And um, I would encourage members of the public to, to, to take this process deadly seriously. You know, uh, you know, and, 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 and I know many members of the public are doing so. The demand for lateral flow tests is very high, thankfully. Um, and I, I think if people, going back to the questions that you put to me, Convener, at the very beginning about the seed, there were questions essentially about how seriously are people taking the testing approach. The testing approach is really important as a tool in stopping the circulation of the virus. So for somebody to be reporting, um, a, a, a test that is inaccurate um, 
I, I don't think I can. If Mr. Fairley forgives me, I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure it's for me to decide what is fraudulent and what is not fraudulent. But it is not the right thing to do, and it therefore just undermines the purpose of the scheme and the taking of the test. So I would encourage members of the public a to test and b to report the findings accurately. Briefly. Very briefly, because I do have to be in chamber, but I'm making this point, and I'm, make, I'm using the word fraudulent because of the if you're 18, 19, 20, Christmas is coming up, and you're going out with your mates, you don't feel bad, but that test comes up as a positive, you might just chance your luck because you feel okay. And I have a genuine concern. That was always my concern about going down this road. And, and I, th I, th I accept these points, and that's why I make the plea for people to be. And, and I don't think it's just 18 and 19 year olds. It's 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 it's, it's, it's everybody. You know, I, I am. You know, personally, I am now undertaking lateral flow tests much more frequently than you know, I was doing them twice a week. I'm now doing them much more frequently because of the degree of interaction I have in the course of my work. I have no social life, but I do have a lot of interaction <laughs> in my that's in my not, work. That's not pandemic news. That's not pandemic. That's nothing new. But it's but it's because of the degree of interaction that I now have as a course of my responsibilities. Thank you. I'm just conscious of time. Are mem members happy for me to put the question to the motion? The question is that motion S6M-02332 to be agreed. Do members agree? Yes. The motion is agreed to. The committee will publish a report to the Parliament setting out our decision on the statutory instruments considered at the meeting later today. That concludes our consideration of this agenda item and our time with the Deputy First Minister. I'd like to thank the Deputy First Minister and his supporting officials for their attendance this morning. Thank you. The committee's next meeting will be on the 9th of December when we will be taking evidence from stakeholders on the vaccination programme. That concludes the public part of our meeting this morning. I suspend the meeting to allow witnesses to leave and for the meeting to move into private.